I'm going to bring up our first two participants, uh, Ms. Gorley, Mr. Dawson, I think I saw you at some point, come on out. Uh, let's give them a round of applause first. Both of these individuals are going to write a story for you, and they're gonna do so backstage, and we're gonna bring them out at the end of the period to read their stories. On this piece of paper that I'm now giving them, which they cannot look at yet, they have four things that they have to include in the story, okay? Whoops, we'll get to that later. The four things. The dollar store. A police officer. A tuba. And the phrase, all the while, Harry Styles. All four of those must be components of your stories. You have about 25 minutes. Are you ready? Yes. Get set. All right, we'll see them later. I'm curious. The tuba particularly, but we'll see. All right, next up, we have a tradition here at Writers Expo, um, another event that we call Two Truths and a Lie. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, let's welcome up the participants for this one. We got uh, Nelson, Elmore, and Tarzinski. Come on up, folks. And feel free to use the very comfy chairs that we borrowed from the CRC. If you wanted to go sit in the CRC anytime the next couple days, you're gonna have less comfortable places to do it. Uh, okay, so each of these individuals is gonna tell you a five minute story. Two of them are telling a truth. One of them is lying to your beautiful faces, okay? Your job is to try and figure out who's the liar. And to do that, not only do you need your brain on and listening and all of that, but after they're done telling the stories, we will have five, 10 minutes, something like that, for you to ask questions to try and figure out who's been lying to you, okay? We get the concept, we're good. Who do you wanna hear from first? Elmore, I heard your, your name, come on up. In the summer of 2015, I embarked on an incredible journey to Bolivia and South America. Our travel group consisted of four teachers, one college student, one journalist, and one doctor. Our mission was to lend support to an after-school program run by a small church in El Alto, a city near La Paz, which is the capital of Bolivia. We brought textbooks and resources for the school and set up a temporary medical clinic where many children received their first ever medical exam. A few facts about El Alto, Bolivia. El Alto has the highest elevation of any major city in the world. By the way, altitude sickness is no joke. Two, El Alto is the largest city in Latin America with a mostly indigenous population. This means many of the people we encountered did not speak Spanish, let alone English. So even though several members of our group were fluent in Spanish, communication was a challenge. As a side note, I know just enough Spanish to embarrass myself and especially my daughter, who was my translator on that trip. At one point, I tried to say I wasn't hungry and instead proclaimed, I don't have a man. <laughs> it turns out, hombre and hombre mean very different things. In the area of El Alto, where we were working, the roads were not paved and most residents did not have electricity or running water in their homes. Children came to these churches after school program, not only for education, but to seek refuge from the crime and poverty that permeated their community. So back to our adventure. After a long flight, we were met at the airport by Taylor and Victor. Taylor is an American who worked for the organization that had been providing aid to the little church slash school where we would be doing our volunteer work. Victor was from another part of Bolivia and served as our driver throughout our stay. Our first day in Bolivia was spent in La Paz, allowing some time for our bodies to acclimate to the altitude before traveling to the even higher altitude of El Alto. After that, we spent our days in El Alto and returned to our hotel in La Paz each evening. It really wasn't safe to be in El Alto after dark. Our hotel in La Paz was near the city center. Traffic was so bad that there were people dressed in zebra costumes who would be out every morning just to help pedestrians cross the street safely. 
There was no place for our driver, Victor, to park the van. So each morning we would have to run to whatever spot he'd found to briefly pull over and jump in as quickly as possible. One day when we were bringing suitcases full of textbooks with us, we took a little too long getting in the van. Sure enough, our driver was issued a ticket by the local police. It seemed a bit odd as we'd watched many other vans packed full of people doing the same. In fact, some would actually drive with the sliding doors open and people would literally jump in or out of the moving vehicles. Victor told us that because he was driving a van full of Americans, he was more likely to be stopped. Another day, Victor, Victor received a speeding ticket. Many other vehicles were driving faster than ours, but Victor accepted the ticket without complaint. That evening, Taylor and Victor set out to pay the tickets. They were gone for hours. It turns out it's quite difficult for a non-resident to pay their traffic fines. Now, the air in La Paz is considered better than the surrounding areas because the altitude isn't quite as high. However, because it's surrounded by mountains, it basically sits in the bottom of a bowl-like depression. This combined with heavy traffic leads to terrible air pollution. For this reason, there are restrictions placed on who can drive on what day, and it's based on your license plate numbers. As luck would have it, unbeknownst to any of us, we ended up driving a, a day we shouldn't have. Of course, our van was pulled over. Victor said it was a known fact that the police would accept cash in lieu of writing, a, uh, writing tickets. So rather than spend hours again to try to pay another ticket, this time he decided to offer some cash to the policeman. Now, anyone who knows me well can tell you I'm a rule follower. I was freaking out in the back of the van, certain we were all going to end up locked, in, locked up in Bolivian prison. Much not to my surprise, not only did the police officer accept the money, he proceeded to lead our van down a one-lane road that was off the beaten path so that we wouldn't be stopped again. He was running backwards, leading us up a hill as he cleared cars and pedestrians out of our way. At one point, we were rounding a sharp corner with the view obstructed such that we had no idea what might be in our path. Now, I was no longer worried about landing in jail. I was worried about landing in the hospital. By the time he got out or got us where he wanted us to be, the officer was pouring sweat. He came to the window to give our driver further instructions and then left us with a smile and a wave. After we safely arrived at our destination, we asked Victor just how much money he had given the officer. Would you believe it was the equivalent of seven US dollars? Okay, Tarzinski is going to be way more entertaining, so we'll leave her for last. <laughs> okay, so my all-time favorite foods are pasta and pizza. I know I join many, many others in this food passion. I suspect I may even have some soulmates right here with me today. I search back in my memory, and there are two pivotal experiences in my life that brought my love of pasta and pizza into keen focus, that lit up all the receptors in my brain and told me I just may have been Italian in a previous life. Okay, so pivotal experience number one. My sophomore year of high school, a girl transferred in and joined my volleyball team. If you care to know, her name was, Deb was and is Debbie. Like many teams, we had regular team dinners hosted by team families. Debbie's parents opted to host one of the first team dinners of the season. I remember this like it was yesterday, walking into her house and smelling the sauce. Yes, I was hungry, but it was like my love for pasta had just found a new gateway to the real, actual pasta heaven. Not this muggle pasta world I'd been living in all these, world, all these years, but this magical place filled with these smells and tastes I'd never known possible. 
Come to find out, Debbie's mom had been born and raised in Chicago, the child of Sicilian immigrants. The woman could cook. You might guess who I adopted as a close friend and whose house became my second home, whose mom became my second mom. In looking for colleges, we all have our reasons for liking certain locations, certain campuses, certain hoped for experiences. As I made my college decision, I felt this draw, this longing for Chicago. And although I didn't fully admit it to myself at the time, a fair percentage of this attraction had something to do with the food. This brings us to pivotal experience number two. I arrived in my freshman year, 2,000 miles from where I grew up, and found myself laying the groundwork for just how I'd go about creating my own magical world of Chicago pizza exploration. Pizza had not been Debbie's mom's thing, but she was highly encouraging of my passion and gave me a couple tips, including the names of some specific Chicago pizza places. Freshman year of college is a massive time of transition. You're getting used to so many new things and figuring out who your people are, how you'll study, what you'll like, when you'll eat, and the list goes on. For me, all of these ended up somehow involving pizza. Ultimately, I decided I needed to be strategic to really cover my bases so I could decide for myself the very best of Chicago pizza. Fortunately, I was able to find others who may not have been quite as passionate about this as me, but were nevertheless able to jump on board as co-adventurers. I had a map of Chicago and its suburbs. In those days, these things called the yellow pages were the means by which you found out phone numbers and locations of various businesses. On my map, I created concentric circles and I bought little green and red push pins. The red pins represented the pizzerias I, want, I wanted to go to or order from. The green push pins represented where I had already eaten. One by one, I replaced the green with the red. I did actually eat other food than pizza. I was excellent at consuming my needed fruits and vegetables, but pretty much all the other food I ate outside of breakfast served to fulfill my quest for experiencing the best and sometimes the worst of Chicago land pizza. I babysat for every professor I could find with little kids to fund this adventure. A fun side note is that some of those professors were also big pizza lovers and they got involved with my efforts. I was able to switch out some of those push pins by these professors ordering in pizza for me and their kids while they went out for the night. And they often let me take home the leftovers. These things are massive gifts to poor college students. This led to my ultimate pizza find in Chicago. You may have been wondering, okay, but whose pizza does she like the best? It's not Giordano's, not Gino's or Gino's East. Yes, Lou Malnati's is amazing and a regular go-to, but my ultimate favorite for various reasons became Pizzeria Uno. When I finally got a car my senior year of college, I began making regular trips to the River North neighborhood in the city, 29 East Ohio, just in case you wanna go there anytime soon. Their deep dish pizza checks every box for me. The perfect proportion of sauce, cheese, and crust. If you're a deep dish person, you know the importance of these proportions. Fun fact, I got to know the owners of Pizzeria Uno and it ended up that their parents knew Debbie's mom's parents. So it kind of felt like fate came full circle and they became my home away from home. I have to give one last shout out. Many years later, I discovered another family owned Chicago pizzeria called The Art of Pizza, located on North Ashland Avenue, and now another is on State Street and uh, that's in the South Loop. So if you're a pizza person, go try their pizza as well. I might go so far as to say their pizza might actually top my list right now. I still love Pizzeria Uno for nostalgia's sake, but ultimately the adventure still continues. I've been lately, I've lately been on a quest for Chicago-based New York style pizza, just kind of a little niche quest right now. However, my heart will always rest with the pizza right here in Chicago. And of course, the pasta born from a Chicago Italian family whose daughter moved 2,000 miles west and landed in my world. Thank you, Debbie's mom. Thank you, Chicago pizza. All right, 
I'm going to be speaking a little fast because this is a little long, so we'll see how it goes. All right. So in this story, the names have been changed to protect the innocent and maybe the guilty. Uh, ben had been a confidant to my best friend Charles in college, working with Charles as a fellow RA. I had been to many of their close-knit gatherings, becoming good friends with Ben, but was thrilled when, after graduation, I heard Ben had a study girlfriend. Charles had received a letter inviting not just him, but me too, to Pittsburgh to meet this girl that he gushed about. Marnie was a doll. With red hair and a flashing smile, she was a little on the short, portly side, but had a wit on her. She welcomed both of us with smiles and hugs, told us where to stash our things, and was eager for us to help make a meal so that we could be a snug little community of friends. Wow, I thought, Ben the Spitfire. I liked her. After spending the next day with Ben and Marnie touring Pittsburgh, we went out to dinner. At dinner, I sat down first with Charles on my left, Ben on my right, and Marnie across. Somewhere during dinner, Ben complimented my outfit and my jewelry. I blushed and gave him a beaming smile. The three of us sat there catching up, laughing about our old exciting times at the dormitory at NIU. I think Marnie felt left out. Suddenly, she gave a hmm, got up, hurried out the restaurant door, and Ben hurried after her. Quizzically, I looked at Charles and asked, did I do something? Worriedly, we chatted until finally the pair, with Marnie nestled in the curl of Ben's arm, came back and we paid the check. Yet there was, there was silence as we drove. Inside the apartment, our hosts retired with a little conversation. So before anyone was awake the next morning, Charles and I dashed out, free and on our way to Gettysburg. The details of the prior evening gone, we took photographs of ourselves on the battlefield and nerdily recited the Gettysburg Address. It was, perhaps, one of the most perfect days of my life. At dusk, we, we reached Ben and Marnie's apartment. Charles rushed himself into the bathroom. After three hours of driving, coffee does a number on you. I put my shoes in the other room near our stuff, which I noticed had been tidied up. Hmm. I rifled through my pockets, and one of the items I had clipped to my belt loop was a small canister of mace, which I hated because it was bulky, but always took with me when I traveled. Marnie approached and greeted me, asking if I could help her with something outside. Sure. Then she said, oh, I see you carry mace. So do I. How does yours work? She held out her hand to take a look at it, and I unclipped it from my key ring to show her the mechanism. Taking it from me, she jumped up and said excitedly, let me get mine, I'll show you. In a flash, she was back and she showed me how hers worked, much like the same as mine. Let's go outside, Marnie said, opening the front door. Oh, uh, do you have my mace? Sorry, I must have left it in the bedroom when I was looking for mine. We'll get it afterwards. I walked down the stairs and out, out onto her front step. I let Marnie take the lead in the darkening dusk and as she walked a few steps forward, I was about to follow when she turned around, looking menacing. I know what you're trying to do, she snarled softly. Whoa, what? What am I trying to do? I was shocked. You know, she said in a low, almost teasing voice, I could hurt you and no one would know. Go ahead, scream. My neighbors are loyal to me. They would help me. And Ben loves me, not you. Instinctively, I put my hand to my belt. She had taken my mace. She had taken my mace. The blood drained from my face. Oh my God. She planned this. Marnie took a step forward, face forcing me back, causing me to sit on the concrete ledge that was beside me, my back against the brick front of the apartment building. I'd never been in a fist fight in all my 24 years, and I was now on the verge of one, and she had some pounds on me. If she knew how to fight, I could be in real trouble. And there she went. Marnie slapped me full across the face, knocking my glasses off. 
I bet you want to hit me, don't you? Go ahead, try, she said. She's baiting me, I thought. If I full on punch first, I could be arrested for battery in Pittsburgh. Like, Slowly, I said, I'm not gonna scream and I'm not gonna fight you. I'll lose. Come on, hit me. No. Marnie growled and came at me, but I had nowhere to go. My back was up against a building. She had a maniacal look on her face, eyes wide, lips in a snarl, and I seriously feared she'd go for my throat. But then miraculously, the front door opened and startled, she dropped her searching hands. Hello said Charles calmly, but looking surprised. Is everything okay out here? Yes, I said sternly, replacing my glasses and glaring at Marnie. Everything's fine. I think we're done here. Angry, Marnie stamped past us into the apartment building. I crumpled into Charles's arms. I told him the whole story, and when I got to the I could hurt you part, he half carried me over to the car. I'll get her stuff, he said. We're leaving now. Inside, our bags had already been neatly packed, and not by us. A wistful Ben stood by and looked down at the floor. Marnie was nowhere to be seen. <laughs> Charles patted Ben on the shoulder, saying, good luck, man, and hurried out the door. Charles threw the bags into the trunk, and we sped off into the deep night with only adrenaline fueling us. We determined that Marnie had been jealous, but it didn't make sense. I had come here with Charles. Ben was in Pittsburgh with her. We were just visiting at her invitation. Was it that compliment about the jewelry? Had she premeditated this treachery for at least a day in revenge for what? Some laughter at the dinner table? Was the whole trip a farce, some kind of sick trap? We never got an answer. In fact, we never heard from them again. Actually, you can keep that mic because they're gonna fire the questions at you guys. Uh, all right, we've got about eight minutes until we have to bring our story, our other storytellers out here. Um, if you wanna try and figure out who's telling the truth and who's lying, just throw your hand in the air and you can fire a question in their direction. And if I don't see you, just kinda wave. Okay. Yes. Uh, Tars, have you looked up Ben on any social media? Like, is he around? Is he okay? I did. About five years ago. Okay. Still there. <laughs> oh, they're like together? Still there. Ooh. Okay. He's learning. Yes, <laughs> if you'll call it that. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is Tarzinski. What year did you like go to Pittsburgh and what year did like this take place? All right, so that's a good question because I'm old. Um, I was 24 then, so it must have been, like I was out of college in 90, no, 94, 95. So I want to say that this must have happened about 96. Six or 97, something like that. I think that's it. I don't do math real well. I'm English, so I was 24, I'm 51 now. So there you go. <laughs> All right, keep it coming. Yes, sir, right in front of me. Uh, this is T, on a scale from one to 10, how psycho was Ben's girlfriend? <laughs> ben, how psycho was Ben's girlfriend? Supposedly, yes. Uh, crazy. I mean, literally, legitimately out there nuts. Seriously thought she was going to do me some real harm. <laughs> so, uh, was she a redhead? Yeah. <laughs> she was. Uh, she, red hair, uh, flashing smile. Yeah, you got it. All right, keep them coming. Still got time. Yes, in the back corner there. Then or currently? Currently. It's Rome. Like as in the city. I mean, we did say no phone, so you can't be doing fact checking right now. <laughs> yes, up front. Oh, there are too many, too many to to list. Um, 
I think like, if I really had to nail it down, I think a really, I mean, if you can count this as possible, I think a really, really good lasagna um, is probably where, where I would go, yeah. Let's go in the middle there. Yep, you. Uh, Nelson, what's Debbie's last name? Mackenzie. Strange story, because she, even though she's Italian, she married an Irish guy. But good question. Uh, up front there, yeah. Ooh, really good question. So, you know, this is like, again, like my, I went from my mom making like pasta sauce, it was like ground beef and some canned tomatoes, right? So this is like a whole new world. So I, I as I look back, like her, I'm, I'm thinking it was probably her like main sauce, which is like a, she would um, cook these multiple meats and then strain them. So like all the fat and all the juices like came into the sauce. Um, so it was just like a, a, a family recipe. Um, so I don't know if there was like, it actually had a name, but it was like this like five meat sauce. And yeah, right up front again. Uh, Nelson, uh, what were like the concentric circles for on your pizza kind of map? You know, it was <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, so it really more had to do with transportation, like what I thought was realistic. So I kind of like, part of my strategy was to, okay, it's like as a freshman, right? What's really realistic in terms of like getting to know the area where you're going to college, like where could I walk um, versus where could I maybe realistically get a ride from another student versus where would I need to take certain different forms of public transportation. transportation. So like pace buses, like where could pace buses go and where could like the Metro take me? Um, so it was just like based on transportation. Yeah, in the middle there, in the white. Um, Mrs. Elmore, what was the doctor's like, name, and what type of doctor were they? What was his last name? Yeah. Dean. And what was the second part? What type of doctor was he? Uh, he was an anesthesiologist. Okay, we're gonna pause it there because we have to bring our two other storytellers out still. Um, take a second. Think through. I'm glad, Elmore, that you got a question there. For a second, I thought everyone just believed you wholeheartedly. Uh, we'll see. All right. Uh, if you actually think Elmore is the one who's lying, raise your hand. Oh, that is not many. They're slowly coming up. Okay. Uh, if you think Tars is just a straight-up liar, raise your hand. Not in general, just with the story. Okay. Um, should have clarified that. And then, how many of you think Nelson was lying to you? That's a pretty good even distribution. All right, let's find out. Uh, could the real liar please stand up? There you go. Well done, Ms. Nelson. Round of applause for her. Very good. All right, you guys can uh, stay there. We may have some, some questions in a second. Uh, Gorley Dawson, you around? Can you hear us? Come on out. All right, so let's just remind you all, they had to somehow write a story at the dollar store, police officer, a tuba, and all the while, Harry Styles. Whoever wants to go first. Hello, everyone. Ah, the tones of a tuba. I love those low notes that are best performed by tubas and basses. When I think of a tuba, it makes me think of the oompa-pa in a polka band, but there's much more to it than that. It also makes me think of our close family friend who plays the tuba. Hey, Matthew. The tuba that I want to tell you about today was played out in front of the dollar store. We had just gone to Bobo's Euros for lunch, and we're trying to figure out what to do with the rest of the day. We noticed that a tuba player was performing in front of the dollar store. The musicians started with a few marches and then took requests from the small crowd that had assembled in front of the store. Finally, as the finale, the tubist ended with an ode to sharks and played the familiar intro to Jaws. Na na, na na, na na, na na. You know what I mean. I can't do it as well, because I don't have a tuba. 
The sounds were so real and inspired fear in the audience. Everyone believed that Jaws was actually going to sneak up behind us and start chomping at our legs, even though we were far from any large body of water. One of the audience members even called 911. When the police officers arrived at the scene, they assured us that there was no danger and that Jaws was nowhere to be found. Of course, they were right, but a lot of people were still panicking. Thankfully, my friend Sophia and I knew better and started discussing the next concert we planned to attend. We weren't sure exactly what he would perform, but we knew all the while that the Harry Styles concert would not involve any sharks. Well, here it was. What a crazy contest to win. Two months earlier, Emma donated $5 to the Police Officer Assistance Fund at a booth at the Libertyville Days, and last week she got a call. She had won the grand prize in the raffle they had for all the donors. She was going to get two minutes to race through the dollar store and fill a brass tuba full of any products, anything they had on the shelves. It was like supermarket sweep meets pumped. How is she going to carry a giant brass tuba and, all the while, Harry Styles, try to stuff it with merchandise? She had borrowed a tuba from the band room at LHS the week before and had been practicing in her basement, running around trying to pick up scattered toys and sticking them in the horn. What a disaster! She was just as likely to tip it over and dump everything out as she was to reach down and effectively pick something up and add it to the space in the horn. Uh, anyway, here it was. Time to shine. The chief of police and the dollar store manager counted her down. Three, two, one, go. And off she ran. Candy aisle, grabbing stuff. Pencils, pens, grabbing stuff. What else, what else? Mm, handful of rubber spatulas. Mm, rubber spatulas? A couple of boxes of aluminum foil, can never have enough of that. Plastic tablecloths, yep, yep. Pack of peanuts, some juicy fruit gum. Mm, super glue, let's stick that in there. It went in and just like that, game over. Everybody cheered as she came to the checkout aisle. They counted her loot and she had 213 items valued at $213, all stuffed into her tuba. Pretty crazy prize, but hey, it was an experience that she'd have forever. There's an extra chair over there and there's a stool. Feel free to take a seat, folks. We still got a couple minutes. So, uh, Gorlin Dawson, I, I have a question for you first. And I think we still got the mic over there, right? Um, did you go with your first idea? Or did you kind of take time to plan it out first before you started writing? Well, like I said, we do have a really close family friend, one of my daughter's best friends who plays the tuba, so I couldn't escape from that. I knew he had to be part of the story, even if it was just small. So I did stick with my instinct. Um, my first idea, I would say I probably had three or four ideas before I walked in here, and none of them fit any of these words. Yes. So, <laughs> it was not at all what I was expecting, so I completely scratched all of the ideas that I thought would work. And the first thing that came to my mind was uh, with the, the dollar store was the supermarket sweep thing. So then now I just went with that. Now that the dollar store is up to $1.25, is there going to be a sequel? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Good. Um, I wanted to open it up to you guys. If you had any questions, the fact that, you know, you got two people here who had to write a story very quickly. You have three people who got some time to craft it. Do you have any questions for the teachers themselves as to writing process or anything that you were just wondering as you were listening to them? Yes, Ms. Singleton. I have a question for Ms. Elmore. So you wrote about Bolivia. How much research did you do? There were a lot of facts that you said at the beginning. So I was just wondering about like that process of research and that. Yeah, so I, I researched online some of those, like I knew we were at high altitude. I, didn't remember exactly how high, right? So I looked up some of those specifics. And then I also called a couple other people that were on the trip because I couldn't remember exactly how much money it was and things like that. I think there's another hand up I saw. Yeah, go for it. Uh, 
Mr. Dawson, what exactly is punked? <laughs> world. <laughs> what is punked? Um, so in my brain, I feel like that was a show that was on cable, maybe MTV, something like that, where they would set up a scenario and people would walk in and it would of course be staged. So it'd be, I don't know, like a job interview, but all the questions that they asked were completely ridiculous and they were on camera and you'd watch like how do they respond to questions, you know, like, so what we want you to do is this accounting position and we're wondering how often do you trim your toenails because that's really important in our office, right? And just watch the people kind of squirm under these crazy scenarios. That's how I remember it. I don't know. It's a good description. Uh, Ms. Nelson, how did you craft your story knowing that you were lying? Like what were your kind of, I don't know. I know, it, is. Yeah. <laughs> it feels a little bit weird. Um, just like something that I've noticed all my life is just that I don't like pizza and pasta. I mean, I like them actually, as I've gotten older, I've come to a greater appreciation, but it always struck me that my peers loved pizza and pasta and I just didn't. Um, and so that's just been a dynamic in my life. So it was just a matter of flipping it and saying like, what if I did? What if I did like pizza and pasta? So I just kind of created this like storyline and fantasy life about what that would be like. And it was actually really fun. And I think that I actually am more drawn to pasta and pizza <laughs> as a uh, result of creating that. Yeah, go for it right here. Yeah, um, I really thought that your whole life was based around uh, Italian food. <laughs> No, sorry. I, I kind of <laughs> wish good. it you was. I kind of wish it was. Like, I'm really sad that, like, you know, I didn't have that that draw. But and part of this, partly where I grew up is in the smack in the middle of Oregon in this little town, and there just was not that influence. Um, so the the pizza and pasta that I exposed to exposed to early on was just not that great. So I think that was partly. Tars, you I know initially told me that your story timed out at like eight and a half minutes, and we were trying to keep it to like five. Uh, I'm curious what you ended up cutting. <laughs> okay, so um, the part that I, one of the parts that I cut out was the end um, because the ending was a reflection of, you know, did I Google him and what did I find and, you know, the fact that he did change his name and things like that. Um, another part was the fact that Charles was actually supposed to be his best man. Um, that that was one of the reasons we were going down there was to celebrate their um, engagement, which adds another weirdness to it. Um, so there was that part as well. And then it was just like little words that I had to, you know, make more concise, that sort of thing. So. Cool. Yeah, in the back there. Um, for Miss Elmore, what was your favorite part My favorite part would be working with the children at the school that we were at. Even though we couldn't speak the same language, um, they were just super appreciative of us being there and super lovable and a lot of fun. Oh, and, they, and also going for a hike in a eucalyptus forest was really cool. That's one of the things we did with the kids one day and it smells like eucalyptus and the eucal it's really nice. Was it hard not to add more about the, a trip that you loved so much? To the writing? Say to the story? Again. Was it hard not to add more details about all the things you loved? Yes, it was. I tried to like focus on the, the part that I thought would be, you know, the most unbelievable or less believable. Um, but I'll also tell you that, that writing this made me really wish I had written it right after the trip. Because all these years later I've forgotten details and I thought, wow, I really should have like written down about the whole trip right when, when I took it. So all of our students going to France, etc. There you go. Uh, yes, go for it. Facebook, via Facebook, we do keep in touch with a lot of them on Facebook. Yeah. Is there a hand up in the back? I thought. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so Debbie comes in. So I had a boss named Debbie McKenzie, 
um, who was a full blooded Italian. I don't think I actually ever ate her food, but like as I pictured like a Debbie, like yeah, I think this is like she did grow up in Chicago, but she wasn't in my childhood. So there is a Debbie McKenzie that exists. She lives in Glendale Heights, by the way, um, but she has nothing to do with my childhood or any other part of the story. I don't know. Is that fair? Can you like? Do you have to like? Oh yeah, okay. totally. Right. You rocked it. Yeah, uh, give a round of applause to our writers, please. They did a wonderful job.